Thanks. I'm very excited to be here, and I um, I thank you again, Anthony, um, as the other presenters have. Um, I'm going to share your story when I go back to our next meeting, and uh, I, I think making it real for people and really having the understanding of the why is so important. Um, I'm going to focus on implementing the PAD guidelines, just specifically the CPOT piece of the PAD guidelines, and um, share that uh, our strategy, which is not dissimilar to what you've heard um, in the other speakers today. I have these are my disclosures. None of them will impact what I'm saying today. Um, what we'll talk about is the problem, and I think the problem was clearly stated this morning as Anthony shared um, the challenge we have um, balancing saving someone's life to saving their life and allowing them to go back to their normal functioning or their functioning prior to their illness. Um, we used a, a model in, um, in our organization called Translating Evidence into Practice and the 4E's Implementation Framework, and so I'm going to walk you through that talking about barriers and strategies and lessons learned. This is the hospital I work at in Ann Arbor, Michigan, St. Joseph Mercy Hospital, a 550-bed community-based teaching hospital, and uh, we have 48 ICU beds. So the important thing, and I think you've heard that through all of the speakers today, is that you need to have a structure for implementing evidence-based practice change. And fortunately, um, Michigan in um, 2003 um, got a AHRQ grant um, for um, improving the quality and um, safety in our ICUs. They contracted with the um, Johns Hopkins Quality and Safety Institute, and we were able to um, put in a number of different interventions that helped us improve the overall outcomes of our patients in the ICU. Um, that allowed us to each hospital or each ICU in the state of Michigan um, created multidisciplinary teams. And that team has been in place in our organization since 2004. Um, and we have a change in membership, but we have the members represented from each of the ICUs in all the disciplines. Um, we focused on uh, infection prevention, sepsis, and, and as the literature has come out in delirium and early mobility and the ABC CDE bundle, that's been where our focus has been. One, you've heard a number of the speakers today talk about uh, culture changes necessary um, as well as putting in the evidence-based practices. And that was one of the unique things about the Keystone Initiative is at the same time we were putting in technical changes, we were also working on adaptive or cultural changes through putting in a program called the Comprehensive Unit Safety Program where we educated staff on the science of safety, identifying defects so you could understand that as long as humans are providing health care, errors will happen and our goal is to prevent that error from reaching the patient and to set up systems and processes to do that. And partnering with senior executives, getting them engaged in why you're doing what you're doing and helping you support that. Learning from each of your defects and so that you can change um, and have it not happen to the next patient. And then implementing teamwork and communication tools. So we continue in our organization to work on our adaptive cultural work as we do and implement the different technical interventions. So we use the Johns Hopkins model called TRIP, Translating Evidence into Practice. It has four steps, um, first summarizing the evidence, then identifying local barriers, understanding what your current process is and how do you fit that new standards of care into um, your process and change that process. Um, also understanding where your issues and barriers might be. Step three, measuring performance, baseline performance, sele selecting those appropriate metrics, and then ongoing measurement. And then the fourth step is ensuring pa all patients receive the interventions, and that's through the four E's um, implementation. And you can see here this is um, the four E's. Two of the E's work on the adaptive piece and the culture change, and two of the E's work on the technical piece. And they work at three levels, executive level, team leaders, and frontline staff. And so we have different messages and different work that we do to ensure that this change then becomes sustainable. 
the specifics to the four E's, um, when we engage, it's telling that why. And so, and it, this is a, as Dr. Klompas said, this is not a uh, uh, sprint, it's a marathon. And so we're in the process of reevaluating how we're doing, and we uh, ha understand that we need to tell our staff the whys more. Um, and so we're recollecting the whys and going to get some personal stories. I'm going to share the stuff that we've learned at the conference and today. So to help understand that harm is preventable, share those stories of patients affected. And unfortunately, based on if you need resources and et cetera, you're going to need to make that business case for that executive uh, group in your hospital. And then educate. This is what do I need to do? What does the evidence tell me? And how do I turn that evidence into behaviors? And, and incorporated into a new process, how do I execute, listening to resistors, standardizing, decreasing that variation that Marianne talked about, and making it easy to do the right thing. Because staff, you don't walk into the hospital as an employee and say, you know, I think I'm going to create an error today. Uh, it, it just doesn't happen. But we got to make it easy to do the right thing. And then learning from your mistakes and then evaluating. How will I know that the change that we put in place is making a difference? And so define those measures and me measure regularly. So the PAD guidelines helped us summarize the evidence very greatly. And so in supplementing that with some of the mobility literature, that was our evidence that we sh um, reviewed in our committee and then began to turn that evidence into behaviors. We had been um, doing a variety of the components that were in the PAD guidelines as well as in the ABCDE bundle. So what we did then was, after reviewing the new publication, um, we performed a gap analysis between what our current practice was and what the new guidelines were sharing. And so we identified gaps. And we identified five gaps, and I'm just going to focus on the first one, but we identified that we didn't have a standardized method to assess pain in patients who were unable to self-report. We also identified that we weren't treating pain first based on the data and surveys with staff. We were still using benzodiazepine drips for sedation um, too much and we didn't, we had a sleep protocol but we weren't following it and we know the correlation between lack of sleep and delirium and then we were not consistently mobilizing our patients beyond getting them up in the chair. So those were our gaps. Um, I'm going to walk you through how we worked on our first one. Again, uh, understanding the whys and, and engaging the staff first in our education we um, defined pain, um, and here are two definitions, one from the American Society of Pain Management Nursing and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Pain is really whatever the experiencing person says it is. And this is a tough thing um, as healthcare providers. We often, you know, you hear all about the drug literature and people getting addicted, and, and unfortunately sometimes our values go into how we manage that pain. And we do have to understand that pain is what the person says it is. And that's why the self-report is the hallmark for identifying pain level. Um, society of Critical Care Medicine and unpleasant sensory or, and emotional experiences associated with actual or potential tissue damage are described in terms of such damage. So then we looked at the recommendation, the guidelines of both the Society of Critical Care Medicine and the American Society of Nursing, and, and how were they going to help us engage the staff and understand that we are having a problem. Um, pain in ICUs is common and undertreated. Data supported that in the PAD guidelines. And then vital signs and behaviors should be flags to investigate pain, not how you determine if a patient's in pain. American Society of Pain Management Nursing, inability to self-report and lack of recognition, poor pain control, and vital signs are not sensitive indicators of pain. So both of the societies recommended that you, um, if a patient can't self-report, you need to use another reliable way. Um, CPOT and the behavioral pain scale were the most reliable and valid recommended by the PAD guidelines, and CPOT was also acceptable um, and recommended by the American Society of Pain Management Nursing. So our gap in practice is we had no standardized tool for a patient who can't uh, self-report. We know that lack of standardization leads to variation in assessment, different nurses, different results, which would result in then in variation in intervention, different nurse, different intervention. 
So here's the CPOT pain tool. I'm not going to go over it in detail. Um, it, it divides it into four behavioral categories, facial expression, body movement, muscle tension, and then compliance with the ventilator, or if you, this patient is not on the ventilator, vocalization. You um, look at the descriptions. You assess the patient when they're at rest. You also want to assess them during an activity like turning, and then you score them based on what you see in each of those categories, what sentence best describes that patient. The score is from zero to eight, and it's not an intensity score, um, it's a score on behavior. So we summarized the evidence, began to create that why it's important, and then we were moving to identifying local barriers. Um, what was our current practice, um, and what, what do we need to do next? and then moving on to measuring. So um, in implementation science, it's, uh, this article defined some common barriers to implementation. So we walked through those. Financial disincentives, well, implementing a CPOT score wasn't going to cause us any money because it was already available in our electronic medical records, so we didn't even have any programming issues. So that was not an issue. Do we have the right skill mix in our ICU, right equipment, and no equipment was necessary, RNs were going to perform this. What were the peer group barriers? And so we didn't think we understood all of those, and so we did a survey of the nursing staff. What's the potential confusion? One of the uh, pushbacks that we got from our general hospital pain group was, wouldn't this be confusing to all providers if you're using a 0 to 8 scale and a, and a 0 to 10 scale? And so we had to work through those barriers. Knowledge, vital signs was probably our biggest knowledge gap in that those should not be used um, to uh, define the level of pain a patient is having, and, uh, and I already talked about the CPOT, and then communication and teamwork. The nursing staff not, not alone needed to understand CPOT, but also the medical staff. So we did a pre-survey of the nurses. One question we asked them is how unsure um, of how they, are you unsure of how to assess and document patients in pain who can't self-report? And you can see here that over 95% of them were unsure. Number of nurses who treated pain before agitation, 60%. And how often are you using heart rate and blood pressure as an indicator of your patients in pain? And you can see that was very high as well. So we defined how we were going to measure performance doing that pre-survey and post-education survey. Um, percent of patients who met their pain goal, and then how was the CPOT used on interdisciplinary rounds. So now we're on the four E's. And we engage the patient by the messages of why this, is, or engage the staff on the messages on why this is important. Pain is common. It's uncontrolled. It's, uncontrolled pain is one of the key memories of all staff that stay in the ICU. And then linking it to value-based purchasing as part of our business case. Educating, we educated the staff on the scale, um, on the that vital signs should be just a trigger to reassess the patient for pain, um, and the education includes using the uh, return demonstration of the CPOT tool. Um, execution, we defined expectations, we created a pocket card um, for the PAD guidelines, and we added it to our interdisciplinary rounding card and reviewed it at huddles, and then we had defined our metrics and we resurveyed the staff. So we determined what dates. Our unit champions were the ones who did the education. We created a PowerPoint that everybody used. We have huddle messages, surveying, audit audits, and daily rounds. So how did we help execute this? Make it easy to do the right thing. So here, besides the staff education, um, we had um, huddle messages that went out to each of the units, and I'm going to talk about that. I want to refer you guys to the ICU Liberation website. There's a great uh, video demonstrating how to do a CPOT on it so that you can use that for education. Um, we also created a pain assessment and management algorithm, a P AD guideline algorithm and an interdisciplinary rounding card. We do huddles, bedside huddle or shift huddles within the units in each of our patient care units in the hospital. This is a structured huddle where we have metrics that we look at and discuss with the frontline staff and uh, um, in the area of quality and safety, patient satisfaction and operations. And so this huddle process um, allows us to bring in new information and also get feedback from the staff on what's working, what's not, and we can learn if we're not meeting um, a specific metric. 
Here is the standardized message that we that each of the um, staff shared at Huddle to be able to get feedback. What was our problem? Why do we need to change? What is CPOT? When should I use it? And how? Um, we created a algorithm to help people decide when you use self-report or CPOT, and then if the patient couldn't self-report based on what their RAS was, if their RAS was below minus four, how would you do that differently? Because you can't use the CPOT if their RAS is minus four, because it's going to be zero because they're not moving. Um, and then we incorporated it in our algorithm of all of the PAD guidelines that we had updated. Um, and you can see here the, in the circled section that it's not just the number rating scale, but if you had a, uh, our goal for CPOT was to be less than two. Then as an independent check, because you have to standardize your process, but then you also want a way to incorporate it into the daily work. And so in our interdisciplinary rounds, our nurses report on these 13 things. And you can see that most of them are related to a lot of our quality initiatives and expectations for what every critical care patient should get. And so um, we talk every day about what is the, the patient's pain, what scale are you using, what What's the score now and what's the goal? And then we evaluated this final section of the four E's and uh, everyone received the education. We did a staff post survey and huddle metrics. So in the staff post survey we went from people unsure of how to assess and document patients pain in patients who couldn't self-report from 96% down to 52%, so still some work to do. Again, it's a, it's a, uh, not a sprint, it's a marathon. Number of nurses who treated pain first went from 60% to 87%. How often are you using heart rate and blood pressure as an indicator of your patients in pain? That went from 96% down to 42%. And the number of nurses who could identify correctly the cutoff for CPOT was 70%. Um, we looked at the percent of patients that reached their pain goal, and so you remember that huddle board I showed you, so we would have the metric each day that would look at, in the past 24 hours, which patients received their, what percent of the patients received their pain goal, and then we'd have a discussion on uh, if we didn't meet 100%, why not, and what could we do different. Next step, continued audits, reviewing the results of those audits at huddles and team meetings, um, audit interdisciplinary rounds to make sure CPOT is being reported, um, ensure that it's added to our new nurse orientation as well as resident and uh, attending. Lessons learned were a lot that have been shared already. Multidisciplinary teams are critical. Having a standardized framework or process for implementing different practice changes is important. Understanding what your current process is, identifying those barriers. Education for CPOT that included a return demonstration. Uh, reinforcing the behavior during interdisciplinary rounds. Standardizing the practice and defining the expectation. And then using the data that you collect on going to w understand where your gaps are and as I've said implementing practice change is a journey so it's not going to be solved overnight. I want to thank you for your time and attention as Dr. Deming has said it's not enough to do your best you must know what to do and then do your best. Thank you very much.